Pastor Trevor Thomas of Koinonia Ministries in Durban, South Africa. The title of my sermon today is Desperate Need for Discernment. My reading is taken from Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18 as read by Tatum Thomas from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak, and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy it or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is is 666. It is good to hear God's word publicly read in the congregation of his people each Lord's Day. I think it was the Victorian preacher Charles Spurgeon who said that the lost gift of the church is discernment. Last week we spoke about Satan's first beast that came out of the sea. He is the Antichrist. Today, we will be dealing with Satan's second beast that is from the earth. It is a person and he is the false prophet as revealed to us in Revelation 16. Only reading much further helps us to discern this necessary detail. This very fact shows us how important it is to pay attention to such details of God's word. We need discernment. But many Christians have been deceived. Generally, they are in search of irrelevant details. By this, they are sidetracked by Satan. They will spend hours trying to figure out the apparent puzzles being resolved on the Illuminati. They use the same lens for conspiracy theories. This pastime has paralyzed them and they cannot catch the flow of God's word. Next to the Bible, they should be reading up on some good literature concerning what God has to say. But just tell them you are having a meeting where they know it has a therapeutic effect. They will definitely be there. The devil has got us where he wants us. In our hearts. We know that certain things are quite harmless and perfectly legitimate. 
I have a question for you. What if these things consume you, and by this your desire for the things of God is less? It is best that you avoid them like the very plague itself. All countries that took desperate steps to curb the coronavirus saw the good fruit of their labour, like the way we must segregate ourselves from an infection. The same is true in our spiritual lives. The novel 1984, published in 1949 by George Orwell, is about a totalitarian state. This idea is about watching its citizens and enforcing its rule of power. We see this in the Antichrist, in the state and the false prophet, who is a propagandist. Propaganda means influencing people with rumours and lies. We desperately need discernment to know when such is the case. So in light of this, my title is Desperate Need of Discernment. I have three points to focus on. Pretension, deception and intention. I open with my first point, pretension, verses 11 and 12. The idea of pretense is that of imitating the genuine. We know that the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus, so the false prophet within the church glorifies the Antichrist within the state. Have you experienced any leader whose approach is gentle and enticing like a lamb? And then his evil intent gets discovered. Just continue listening and you will hear him speaking with arrogance. Well, he has the pretense of the lamb, but he actually speaks like the dragon, who is Satan. This is a tactic. In John's day, the Roman emperors craved that religious attention must be given to them. They wanted to be worshipped. The only way they got this dream realized was to use a strategy. In the seven cities of Rome, they built temples. The priest in each temple was the whistleblower of pagan beliefs. Control was the driving force. How does one gain control? Remember how Jesus likened false prophets to beasts? He said they will come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. This is a picture of a traitor residing in the church. There is only one way to discern that there is a traitor. It is to see how dissident doctrines contrary to Christ are given airtime next to the teachings entrenched in the very foundations of our faith. God has his chosen vessels, his soldiers of the cross, who are able to discern the plot to contaminate and corrupt the church. The very first level of Christ-filled discernment is to look out for anyone who comes in the spirit of grace, but whose speech is that of the dragon. This means if an addition is made to a foundational teaching of Holy Scripture in a conference, a college, or any meeting, then the dragon is at work. The second thing is to figure out the appearance of such a ministry. The third thing is when you see what professionalism goes into a conference of this nature, it makes you think. Lots of money, time and effort has been put into it. The speakers are chosen carefully. The pamphlets and programs are colourful. The music 
is buzzing. The welcome is endearing. The Q&A, that is, the question and answer format, is alluring. The meals are salivating. What more do you need? But if just one foundational teaching of Christ is amiss, then this is a scenario of the spirit of the Antichrist from the sea and the spirit of the false prophet from the earth. They are both working hand in hand, bowing to their Lord, Satan. This is a mixture of politics and Christ. This is a bad mixture. You can't mix Christ with politics. When you do, then you are selling propaganda, which is exactly what the false prophet is doing in our verses in 11 and 12. It is given to us to know that the koi fish swims against the tide, like up a waterfall and up the current of the sea. The Chinese have some sort of proverb. They say that when you swim up the current like this koi fish, then you become a dragon. I wonder if that kind of power is thought of when they speak of karate and Shaolin Kung Fu in terms of the dragon. There is a dangerous power at work in Satan the dragon and his antichrist and false prophet. There is also a dangerous grace at work. We need discernment. The mist of pretension is in the very air of our 21st century Christianity. The more dangerous of the two beasts is the false prophet. He has made inroads inside the church of Jesus Christ to topple and destroy it from within. He serves the Antichrist. He's good in preparation, good in the media, good in PR work, and even good when the fat lady sings. This saying means one should not presume the outcome which is still in progress. It is giving you an inkling that there is something else up the sleeve of the false prophet. We have to wait and see. The false prophet doesn't think twice about marrying the prevalent culture of the day with the church. I come to my second point, deception, verses 13 to 15. The false prophet specializes in a mix to cover the whole field. He is very methodical and behaves like the true prophet. He leaves no stone unturned, as the saying goes. He is able to cause fire from heaven. Remember that time when Elijah invoked fire from heaven against the prophets of Baal? What is that a symbol of? It is speaking the word of God in the spirit of Elijah, in the spirit of true conviction, by rightly dividing the word of truth. So why is the false prophet able to bring fire from heaven? It is not the same thing. He poses to speak with conviction, but inside his words are lies and deception. Dear people of God, I want you to think carefully. You are made in the image of God. When you fell, God remade you in Christ. He wants you to be awake. You must be a Berean Christian. Yes, read Acts 17 to see from where that idea comes from. You cannot afford to sleep. The Bereans who Paul preached to examined his very words. The Bible says that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Let's get this straight in our heads. No preacher or teacher is an authority to the extent that he eclipses you from Christ. You must check out every such person who holds the preaching function of ministry. As far as I know, 
we as preachers are open to being questioned and examined. If anyone thinks he is above the law of God, then he is a false prophet. God gives counsel to every member of his flock. The fear of man is the road to hell. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you have determined to slumber through your Christian life, I sound the alarm in Zion. It is time to wake up. It is time to arise and shine. Have you ever thought that unknowingly? You may just be one among many making the Antichrist by your own manner of worship. How so, may you ask? Watch. Your fallen nature tells you that you deserve worship. So when you see someone being raised higher than you and is worshipped by the people, your ego tells you that you can be like that. You just added more polish and paint into making the Antichrist. That is why when we plot to have some great conference, campaign, crusade, or bring and share, we look for an Antichrist as our guest speaker. Yes, isn't that true? Of course, we are looking for a preacher, but we are actually looking for a candidate who actually matches the Antichrist. What is the giveaway? He must be popular. He must be rich and famous. He must be influential. He must be an international speaker. And the list goes on. There is nothing fully wrong with these traits. But there is a very important thing we haven't checked. His purity of the teaching of Jesus and his purity of lifestyle. If you think that all of this is far-fetched, let me take you to what John faced when the locals in each province or city got news of their emperor in regal garb and high and lifted up. That gave them the reason or the excuse to erect idols using those idols to demand worship from the people. Why did they put all their bets on this? It is because they did all of this in the name of the emperor who was above them. Oh, we are the same. Human nature has not changed. We have the idol of motivational preaching, the idol of soothing songs, the idol of trance-like worship, the idol where the pastor becomes the medium which is similar to the cult known as the spiritualists. We are no different from the Jehovah's Witnesses who dethrone Christ by devaluing his deity. We are no different from the Mormons where Christ is a God among gods. We are no different from the Christian scientists where Christ is a divine idea. In the epic miniseries made in 1984, The Last Days of Pompeii. Arbaces is a chief priest of Isis. He's a con man. In the name of the emperor, Titus, who is far away in Rome, Arbaces plays his idolatrous game in the city of Pompeii. He has a ventriloquist making an idol to appear to be speaking. The masses get carried away. He threatened the Christians with death if they did not become members of the temple. What is the real reason why there are so many cults with such false teachings? They are imitating the witnessing church by bringing false fire and making idols speak is an imitation of the witnessing church. The danger is that we as the church have become slippery. We have become like them. 
being surrounded by them, we forgot our blueprint of what true witnessing is. What is the point? The unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet is deceiving us by an appearance of witnessing to imitate true witnessing. In doing that, many of us left our path and joined them. What is worse is that we are doing such things in the very sanctuary of the true and living God. I conclude with my last point, which is intention, verses 16 to 18. What is the intention of the unholy three? Ownership. We as Christians must know when this intention is present. It is not just to expect it at the very end of the world, but John in his epistles tells us that Antichrist is already present in the world. For us this means anti-Christian forces are at work. This began in John's day, and we must be discerning to see its face leading up to the final hour of the end of the world. When the reformers of the 16th century saw these forces at work in the church of their day, this gave them the reason to formulate the Westminster Confession of Faith. Irrespective of our size, status, or sphere of power, the false prophet is pushing for a mark of ownership on our right hand or on our forehead. As marks of ownership, such as pierced ears were on slaves in John's day, and as tattoos are marks of ego in our day, we think that the mark spoken about here is literal, but this is not the case. We have to be true to symbolic interpretation. Just as the Antichrist coming from the sea doesn't mean a literal sea, we must reason the same here. The sea represents the political character of the Antichrist. Also, if we scroll forward to the end of the book of Revelation, we read that there would be no sea. This is not talking about a literal sea, but political chaos that has robbed the world of which will come to an end. This mark is not literal. Christ, the owner of his people, sees this mark. Also, Satan, the owner of his people, sees this mark. For example, the blasphemous names on the forehead are known by Satan. There are so many, they cannot fully, literally be written on the forehead of Satan's disciples. I don't want to sound facetious, but I ask you to show me a Christian who literally has the numbers 777 on his forehead or on his right hand. I mean, after all, it is the number of completion. It is God's mark and seal. There is no such thing. Seven is a complete number and we as Christians are symbolically marked by it. It symbolizes perfection and completion as the seventh day of rest did, and Christ fulfilled it. In Deuteronomy 6, 8, Moses, under God's instruction, taught the people to bind God's word on their hands and before their eyes. This is not literal, as the eyes are the window of the mind. They were to think biblically as the hands are the gears of the heart. They were to act biblically. This is all done by the Holy Spirit 
with no control whatsoever. The Spirit doesn't control believers. He guides them. He is a person. He is our paraclete, our guide. The beast who is the false prophet controls his followers. He instills fear into them. He demands of them to have a mind that thinks the way he says they must think. They are only under his spell as long as they are injected by his poison. But a greater and stronger conqueror has overpowered Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Only when you are under this conqueror, Jesus, his domain, will you overpower Satan and his beasts. So, by controlling the mind of unbelievers, the false prophet is imitating Jesus, who guides the mind. And his mark of control is 666. It is not a literal number on the hands and the forehead. We dealt with what the number 666 stands for in the last sermon. Now we know it is deeper than that. So I call every Christian to attention. The time of shallow and superficial preaching, empty of substance, is not on. We need to go fishing into the deep with Jesus. And we are not going to catch fish. We are going deep into the waters of the world. Now is the time. Cut your praise and worship time. Cut out the adverts and the sideshows, and instead feast upon the power of the word. You can only do that if the messenger is very prepared. If he is not prepared with substance, you are in a hopeless situation. I say this because in most places we have simulated the work of the Spirit with long and protracted extras. One day, the German reformer Martin Luther was told by a brand of Christians that the Holy Spirit literally speaks in their meetings. Luther was curious, and so he told his trusted friend, Philip Melanchthon, that he wants to visit this place where the Spirit speaks so he can learn something. After he visited, his friend was very eager to get the news of Luther's experience. He asked him, Did the Spirit speak? Luther said, Wow, the Spirit spoke. Well, what did the Spirit say? retorted Philip. Luther said, The Spirit said, Luther, you're not prepared. Well, people of God, when are we going to take courage to read good sermons or listen elsewhere to good sermons if we are not getting them? We need to, so we can nudge our pastors to prepare well, so they can preach well. I can never wash out of my mind the effect that the revivalist, George Whitfield had upon his people. Reading his biography by Arnold Dalymore, I was moved. Whitfield was a man I can admire till the day when my candle burns out. Even the last evening of his life, he mustered up the strength to mount the stairs of his church. At 55, he was tired and worn out because of his life of labor, preaching for Christ. He was not supposed to leave his bed. But as he ascended the stairs, people came pressing in at the door. They were begging to hear the gospel 
from his lips once more. In response, he paused on the landing and began to preach. There he stood, candle in hand, and such was his zeal that he spoke on, heedless of the passing of time, till the candle finally flickered, burned itself out in its socket, and died away. That candle was strikingly representative of Whitfield's life, a life that, in its holy burning, had long given forth brilliant light and constant heat, but burned its last that night. O oh, beloved people, what courage in such a people who pleaded with their pastor to preach. O oh, pastors, what courage to preach the unsurpassed substance of the gospel before our candle expires. Until next time, may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon. If you wish to hear more from Trevor Thomas, please like and share this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel apostolic witness and to turn on the notification bell. May the Lord bless and keep you.